Hello everyone, welcome to Cracking Addiction. My name is Dr. Fergal Armstrong and we have with us Dr. Richard Bradlow. So Richard, I thought today we'd talk about thiamine and Wernicke's and alcohol. What are your initial thoughts? Thank you for having me once more. Disappointed that I'm not being referred to as the regular guest. So I don't know. You are the regular guest. I'll be at one point, <laughs> if I keep referring you to you as the regular guest, then are you truly regular? I, 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 you've, you've is lost it not better mind. just as is it not better just to assume you are the regular guest? Oh, I hear what you're saying. I hear what you're saying. No, I like I'm. I live in constant state of being cut from this podcast. Anxiety about that, so I need to be constantly reassured that oh, I'm yeah, the regular right. guest. Okay. Well, everyone who's listening, regular re- guest, Dr. Richard Bradlow, addiction psychiatrist. So, so alcohol, thiamine, and Wernicke's. Your thoughts. So, I mean, obviously, this is one of the these DT and uh, seizures and Wernicke's. This is what we fear. Um, yeah. uh, I mean, so that's a thiamine deficiency. Wernicke's encephalitis is a result of thiamine deficiency. Um, how does thiamine, how does this is this is belief I find amongst a lot of sort of medical students and, and, and junior doctors that ma- alcohol is some sort of direct effect on thiamine in the body to reduce the thiamine. That is our, our understanding of that is that it's not the case. Essentially, thiamine is stored in the liver and absorbed through the gut, and you need to have a balanced diet to have thiamine. People with alcohol use disorder do not have a balanced diet because of the salient features of alcohol use disorder, meaning that they're paying less attention to having a balanced diet. They damage their gut wall and they damage their liver, and that is why they get thiamine deficiency. What well, I'm I thought that alcohol directly inhibited the ability of, uh, the, of the gut to actually absorb thiamine. Yeah. So is that I'm, not true? I've tried to do some reading about this. It is I've I've read it as proposed, but I look. I'm happy for someone to write in and and finally free me of this uh, fear that I might be a fraud by pointing out I am a fraud. But my, my best understanding is it's not true. It, the alcohol damages the gut wall, and the gut wall is needed for thiamine. And thiamine right, is a vitamin, right. and vitamins are incredibly poorly absorbed in general. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. To be fair, actually, Richard, I I've actually tried to do. A literature review on the precise mechanism by which the alcohol inhibits thiamine absorption. And there were a couple of papers, maybe 10, 15 years old, talk about the direct toxic effect on thiamine transporter one and thiamine transporter two, but there's nothing replicated in humans recently. So yeah, I, 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 I suppose I just accepted that mantra without question, whereas you were brave enough to question it. Well, look, I, anyway, I think why I, why I raise that, because I think it's really important when I'm screening someone for, am I concerned about thiamine deficiency, yeah. instead of thinking about, you know, if it was having a direct atta- effect, you, re- you really would be concerned about the, con- the amount of alcohol consumed. But what I'm concerned about is, is this person eating a balanced diet, which I always ask about, the degree of liver damage they have, which again, I'm, I'm assessing for in my, in my assessment. And uh, importantly, have they had, you know, do they have some sort of, do they have celiacs or something else that would damage the gut wall? Have they had some sort of bowel surgery, reduce, reducing the, the amount of, of gut and absorption they have? Those are my big risk yeah. factors when I get concerned for thiamine deficiency. Yeah. Um, and so that's so why I'm sort of st- trying to, sorry, go, go, sorry. No, after you. No, I was just saying that's my sort of, I like to understand things that are, Rather than your your mnemonic acronym system, I like to sort of understand the reason behind things and then work work up from the baseline level, and that's why I, I raise those things. Yeah, and it's a very valid point that you do raise. So, thiamine stored in the liver. How much thiamine stored in the liver? Oh, it's a very good question that I'm sure you know the answer to. <laughs> well, actually, I do. <laughs> I, I try not to ask questions the answers to which I don't know. Yeah, it's about twenty to thirty milligrams. So, yeah, you can you can get very quickly thiamine depleted. Uh, you know, two or three months. You know, you've got none left. And as we know, it's so. So let's take it one step further. So what we know, it's absorbed in the gut. And gut integrity is 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 pardon the tautology integral to the absorption of thiamine. We know it's stored in the liver. What's its function? You know why? Do, why do human beings need thiamine? Again, that is that is a terrific question uh, that I'm sure you know the answer to. <laughs> I know it, it has it has a role in 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 the building block of 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 the nervous system. You win. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well. <laughs> 
How about we say this? So thiamine, active thiamine, thiamine diphosphate or thiamine pyrophosphate is an essential cofactor for um, pyruvate dehydrogenase, alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase, uh, ketoacid dehydrogenase, and also transketolase, red cell transketolase. So these are enzymes that mediate the production of um, right, um, basically NADPH and energy. So the building blocks of life and cellular energy. And if you don't have thiamine, you, the cells which are very highly dependent on a, on a routine regular supply of cellular energy die. You know, if you've got no energy in a cell, you die. And in particular, the cerebellum and the mammillary bodies and the midbrain, they're, they're very sensitive to the effects of thiamine deficiency. So when, we, so when we're talking about thiamine deficiency, we are um, we're particularly worried about the, neuro, the neurological um, manifestations of it. But what's berry berry? I will, yeah, you, you're too good, Virgil, because I was feeling quite inadequate, so I was going <laughs> to... I was I was gonna try and cat, catch you out with like, oh, what, what do you call thiamine or thiamine deficiency when it's in a sort of a child developing? Yeah. So berry berry, right? So first of all, let's go back to the history of berry berry, right? So Jacobus Bontius was a Dutch physician in the Catching 16th name. century, right? And so he was basically see what they used to do in the 16th century in, in, in Holland. If you went to med school and you graduated. You were, you were classified as fit for local service or fit for foreign service. And so he was classified as fit for foreign service. Mm. So he got sent to the Dutch East Indies, which, you know, is, we now call Indonesia. And he came across these people in one of the, one of, on Java, I think it was, where they, were, they had this very ataxic gait. And so he called this ataxic gait. It was reminiscent to him, at least, of the, the, the gait that sheep have. And so the word berry berry actually means sheep in a local language. So that that kind of presentation of ataxia associated with some form of condition was named berry berry. Now it took it didn't it didn't occur until about 1920, 1930, that um we actually worked out that beriberi is due to thiamine deficiency. Now, beriberi can, can be thought of as either peripheral or central. So if we're talking about peripheral beriberi, so if it's wet, it means it's causing heart failure, and heart failure causes edema. If it's dry, there's no heart failure, but the peripheral nerves are affected, hence the ataxic gait. And then we've got the central uh, beriberi where you've got this Nerve damage to the brain, which is consistent with Wernicke's encephalopathy. So I often think of Wernicke's encephalopathy really as a central dry berry berry. But yeah, it's important to understand that thiamine deficiency could present in a myriad of ways. Absolutely. Fergal, there's some, some dead air here. I'm not sure you didn't ask me a question. You stopped talking. So diamond deficiency can present in a myriad of ways. I love the history of this lesson on very, very, from a very practical and perhaps less educated point of view. Wernicke's triad is, is typically yeah. ataxia, ophthalmoplegia, and uh, confusion. And I think a, another thing I run into with, with eager young BPTs who are across their exams is they'll, they'll tell me it's not Wernicke's encephalopathy because they only have two of three of the triad, to which I slap them in the yeah. face. Uh, I, <laughs> I think this is the appropriate answer to that to that statement. That's, that's, that's balderdash. Um, no, actually, yeah. So, so the classical triad of Wernicke's, as you say, ophthalmoplegia, ataxia, and confusion only happens in 10% of people with Wernicke's. And really, I mean, you know, from a very practical point of view, I actually take the view that any new neurological syndrome yeah. or symptom or sign that occurs in the context of alcohol withdrawal has to be diagnosed and treated as thiamine deficiency, Wernicke's. Absolutely. And what do you do? Yeah, well, I, I, and I think it's just on that. And especially when you're seeing a patient that you don't know, to me, any sort of uh, neurological yeah. disease, I'm assuming is new. And I'm assuming is 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 thyme, yeah. It, yeah. Wernicke's. And the most common yeah. thing I see is dysdiakinesia. 
Decide dis- dyskinesia. It's a hard word to say. Yeah. Um, and so, I mean, you know, people say, you know, oh, you, you've got to make a diagnosis before you treat. And I often think, well, what's the risk benefit ratio? You know, mm. What are the risks of giving thiamine versus what are the potential benefits? And remember, the mm. potential benefit is, is possibly the prevention of irreversible brain damage. Mm. So really, you've got to have a low threshold for giving bucket loads of thiamine. Yes, it is a bit expensive. And yes, it is an injection. Um, and yes, there are some people that might have an allergic reaction very, very rarely. But really, the, the, the chance of preventing irreversible brain damage, I think, outweighs a lot of those considerations. Yes. I don't think that uh, I don't think the expense of thiamine is realistically comparable to perhaps someone having Wernicke's or Wernicke Korsakoff's uh, uh, syndrome and, and a lifetime of cost to the to the healthcare system. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, tell me this: Why do we give high dose parenteral thiamine when we when we when we're treating Wernicke's? Yeah, this is actually an interesting thing because I read, read it once, read about this once, and again, there's not too much evidence for it. There was an interesting paper I once read where they actually compared giving someone oral thiamine at a high dose yeah. in the early starts, and I thought to myself, "Geez, this was a very bold. <laughs> How did this one get past um, <laughs> the ethics committee? <laughs> it's like we're going to perhaps yeah. give someone substandard care. So we give it because there's a concept that you do that you need that if your thiamine stores are so low that the transport across the gut is actually an active process, and if your thiamine stores are so low, then you're not going to be able to actively transport thiamine across the gut yeah. because you need a bit of thiamine to get a bit of thiamine, uh, and also yeah. just to get it up into your system as quickly as possible because this is such a serious illness. Uh, though, I, as I said, I read a, a, there's a, there is an RCT out there where they they compared it, and within three days the thiamine levels were similar. So they were testing yeah, thiamine levels yeah. in the blood and they were giving, which I thought incredibly bold move, but good on them. But we, we do it because because I think the most immediate thing is if someone's low on thiamine, you need to get as much thiamine in them as quickly as possible. Yeah. To me, when I'm seeing someone coming in for alcohol detox, I'm not thinking to myself, am I giving them thiamine? Am I giving them oral thiamine or parenteral? I'm thinking to myself, am I giving them parenteral thiamine 300 milligrams a day or am I giving them parenteral thiamine 300 milligrams TDS? That's, that's yeah. the question. So what, what makes you... Make that distinction. When do you decide to get just once a day versus TDS dosing? Well, I think it goes back to me assessing the risks and seeing if they're, if I'm concerned this person could possibly have a, a, be a, a more of a risk for a thiamine deficiency. Because obviously, if I think this person has Wernicke's encephalitis, I will uh, be advocating for them to go to a medical unit where they can get intravenous thiamine uh, and, and a neurological workup. I, I wouldn't keep them on a detox. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so it's, 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 it's if I think they have those risk factors that make me more concerned. Yeah. yeah. But obviously not not presenting with Wernicke's. So I, I, um, I often reflect on the, on the incidence of, of Wernicke's and encephalopathy, and I, I often wonder, well, I used to wonder, why is it that we see this in alcohol withdrawal? If, if thiamine deficiency is a, is a deficiency state, it doesn't just magically appear at the moment that someone goes into alcohol withdrawal. And I suppose really the explanation for that is that, that alcohol withdrawal increases your metabolic rate because it's a, it's a hyper, it's a, it's a catabolic state. You know, your, your, all your energy systems are in overdrive. And there's a high demand for energy. And of course, going back to the reason why thiamine is, is important for us, i.e. it's a building block for the production of energy. If you if you have an excess of demand for energy in your hypermetabolic state due to alcohol withdrawal, that is probably the tipping point where that's the point where your previously precarious thiamine stores just run out at that time. And that's when you actually go into Wernicke's encephalopathy, but there is, you know, the, the, you know, if if you've got a a previous long-standing alcohol use disorder, you will have risk factors for chronic thiamine deficiency that has yet to tip into Wernicke's. I'm realizing now. I said encephalitis before, and I'm sure there's people yelling, yelling at into their earphones. Uh, I meant to say encephalitis. Tomato, tomato. Yeah. Tomato, uh, well, tomato. I'm sure there are people that really care about that sort of thing. Uh, you got, uh, the other thing that I think is interesting about uh, Wernicke's, and I, I, I want to talk to you about is, is Phil, because you sort of raised it about 
where's this come from? Is Wernicke's other rates similar across the world? I have no idea. So it's actually really interesting. But tell me your thinking. Tell, tell me your thinking over this. They're, they're really not. So this is really interesting literature to read about. Uh, right. They're not similar across the world, and it does not correlate to alcohol per capita. So really? Australia, for some reason, is way overrepresented, even though, and we do drink a lot, but France, who drinks a lot, is way underrepresented. Isn't that interesting? Is that because the French eat better than the Australians? Is so it to this, do with diet? This, so the study I, I read a while ago about this, I see, and I cannot remember the top of my head, I beg your pardon, I think it's a very interesting subject that I, I encourage uh, people to read about. It sort of suggested that as an option, but really said, we don't know. But isn't, isn't, isn't that an interesting really? thing? Yeah. So it's not related on, on a national or on a public health level. It's not related to alcohol consumption. I think I think there is a correlation, but it's it's not a great correlation. It's not perfect, you know. Mm. And it and it well, also struck me that Australia is overrepresented. Yeah. So is Australia? Does Australia have a higher per capita alcohol consumption than France? Mm, I. That's a very good question. My suspicion yeah. would be maybe. <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> probably not. <laughs> probably not. But we really give it a crack. I, I uh, would. I mean, you know, I don't have this information off the tip of my off the tip of my fingers. But I would, I, if I had to make a guess, I would say probably yes. Oh, well, you're I'm looking you know, this up even as we speak. I'm, I'm looking right. it up right now. I'm locking in. No, I'm, I think the French like to drink, but we're gonna we're gonna have. A I think they know how to drink sensibly. I think they've got a wine cafe culture that limits the amount of egregious intoxication that we might otherwise see. Uh, well, you would be wrong. My right, quick Google us. has France at France at twelve point six liters of alcohol. That's a lot uh, per person per year, and Australia at ten point six. So, where do if you wanted to eat thiamine, how would you get it? That's a terrific question, and I'm sure you know the answer to. Well, I know it's fortified, and I'm sure you get. Um, You've, it's obviously found in liver because it's stored in the liver. So if you eat liver, you get fine. But I, I think it's all found in cereals and breads and that kind of thing. But it is also fortified, I believe. Yeah, fortified in cereals, pork, fish, beans, lentils. So certainly, I mean, if you're a vegan, um, you're at risk of soluble B vitamin deficiency, including thiamine deficiency. So um, you need to be careful. And so, you know... In, in any kind of person with a, you know, a history of hazardous alcohol consumption, however which way we choose to define that, I think it's really important to recommend thiamine replacement. How would you do that? What would, they, what would you suggest people take? Uh, vitamin, vitamin uh, B1 tablets daily. I mean, yeah. uh, even three times a day. I think that's an interesting thing is where you often see people uh, taking multiple tablets at once, but we usually advise against that because of the poor oral bioavailability of thiamine. recommend you, you space your thiamine out throughout the day. Yeah. Uh, but that's yeah. more of an effort. I, I generally say to patients, it's $10 for a three-month supply. Just just take it when you can. You know, I'm not going to ask too much of you. You know, if this is someone who's <laughs> who's drinking and is not going to reduce their drinking. So this is, this is, this is harm minimization. I say, please... Buy a, buy a box of B tablets and take them when you can. Yeah. Just leave them at your front door. Now, do you know, here's a point. Do you talk? Are you talking about B complex? Or are you talking about thiamine B one per se? So I, I encourage B one. Uh, yeah. I I understand that B complex is much more available, and, I, and I'm not going to have that fight. Well, again, this is this is harm minimization. You want them to have thiamine because a thiamine tablet has 100 milligrams of thiamine in it. A B complex has a lot less. A Barocca, which the elves recommended earlier, has 12 milligrams of thiamine in it, which is substantially less than 100. Uh, so you'd have to eat 10 Barocca's a day to get one thiamine tablet. Yeah. Would you move more? I wonder. <laughs> well, you'd be going to the toilet a lot. You know that you know that video of the bloke, of the middle-aged bloke with the gut on the treadmill sucking on his Barocca juice. <laughs> I'm now of that age where I'm thinking maybe it would work for me. <laughs> oh, I, I have a Barocca uh, quite often. I, I really like them. I just like the taste. <laughs> right. Mm. All right. So maybe maybe that's the key to to get anyone with an alcohol use disorder to like the taste of Barocca because at least it's something, as you say, harm reduction. Yeah, I've got a trivia question for you. What is the main enduring symptom of Wernicke Corsakov? So you've had your Wernicke's in cephalopathy. Ah, is well, we haven't even spoken about we haven't spoken about the, the, the sequelae of untreated Wernicke's. 
Well, I've just I've just asked you. <laughs> do you want me to? To me, it is well. It is significant memory deficits, and it's an ataxic. Yeah, yeah. Game, and it's so so wonderful. so it's important for people to realise that thiamine. Wernicke's, thiamine deficiency causes Wernicke's encephalopathy, which is a potentially reversible brain condition. <clears throat> but if left untreated, it can progress to irreversible brain damage uh, called, well, Korsakoff psychosis. I used to refer to it as Rimsky-Korsakoff syndrome until someone pointed out, actually, it's just Korsakoff syndrome. Who was Rimsky? Rimsky Korsakoff uh, is a famous, uh, famous um, composer. Maybe the elves could uh, tell us what exactly he composed. But anyway, right. So Korsakoff's uh, DECA, D E C A records, DECA, dementia, euphoria, confabulation, and a dense amnesic gap. Mm. Those, those are the symptoms of uh, Korsakoff psychosis. And really, it's, it's not really a psychosis. It's a misnomer. It is a dementia illness. Mm. So it's a it's a permanent irreversible brain damage. Mm. And the um, yeah the 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 memory the memory deficits are incredibly are incredibly notable. Um, yeah, yeah. The confabulation, and and it's it's so sad to actually see because it really reflects a misdiagnosis and ne- clinical negligence, doesn't it? Yeah. It's, it, I have one more question. I know. Sorry, we're getting we're getting the, the red light from the elves to wrap it up. What, what do you think of the, the concept of subclinical Wernicke's encephalopathy? So I, I had, a, I had, a, I had a, a, a consultant once tell me that he believed that there was rampant subclinical Wernicke's encephalopathy. Well, I think there's gross underdiagnosis of Wernicke's. So, I mean, thiamine deficiency. And the, the other thing is that, that we need to understand that Wernicke's is a symptom complex associated with specific localized lesions in the brain. Mm. But thiamine deficiency per se causes other lesions in the brain and also in the peripheral nervous system that are not technically speaking Wernicke's. So you have this. Mm. I can't remember what the figures are, but, you know, the, 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 the only 80% of people with Wernicke's are diagnosed uh, before death, so there's there's twenty percent of people that are diagnosed with Wernicke's after death. You know, because they've, had, uh, they've had a brain autopsy, mm-hmm. and the other thing is that you know cerebellar disease, which is very, which is a manifestation of thiamine deficiency. That's not necessarily that's not necessarily uh, Wernicke's, but it's still thiamine deficiency. Sure. It's the same and process. That's very common yeah. in, in people who drink alcohol. So subclinical Wernicke's versus a, a separate. Or, organelle structure within the brain. I think it's tomato, tomato. Sure. At the end of the day, it's thiamine deficiency affecting various parts of the brain. So in, in answer to your question, I would agree there there probably is. There's a lot of subclinical or underdiagnosed Wernicke's, and for heaven's sake, get in the thiamine. Fantastic. Thank you so much for having me. Richard, you're a regular guest. I think the next show that you should host, in fact, yeah, I'll be, next show, he, he, I'll be Richard's guest. How about that? <laughs> See you next time. Thanks for watching. My name's Dr. Fergal Armstrong, and this has been Cracking Addiction.